So that was just incredibly inspiring and difficult to follow up. Um, it would be uh, a mistake on my part if I didn't uh, acknowledge the incredible contribution made by Green Cell Atlanta for tonight's event. Uh, the new Forsyth County Kiwanis Club is lucky to have uh, a committee that's focused on environmental issues. And I'm overwhelmed at the program that was put together this evening, but the participation of Green Cell, um, whether on a tech side or also just in their amazing grassroots uh, participation and the things that they're already doing in our county and through our community are incredible. I also wanna take a minute and acknowledge some special guests that are on with us this evening. U.S. or um, Georgia State Representative um, Angel, Angelica, uh, Hosh, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. She's from District 50. She represents the, dis, uh, the area of city of Johns Creek. Um, Todd Jones was also joining us this evening from District 25 that covers sort of the South Forsyth and North Fulton area as a state representative. And then Kristen um, Morrissey, I believe I saw her log on and she represents District 2 on our Forsyth County Board of Education. And we're so excited about our Forsyth County Board of Education in our science program and, and just across the board, we have an amazing Board of Education. I also wanna acknowledge Suzanne Harther. She is the program manager of the U.S. Green Building Council. And um, last but not least, April Millam, who is not just a member of Forsyth um, Kiwanis Club, but, she, but she's also the community outreach manager for Keep Forsyth County Beautiful. And we are partnering with them um, on a couple different projects. And so we're very excited to have all of them join us this evening. And then to begin our presentation, I want to share some information about uh, Jaco Selka. She is the person that's gonna be hosting and leading this event and, and hosting the whole panel discussion. And Jaco graduated from the University of Georgia only in 2019 with a degree in environmental economics and management. She also holds a certificate in sustainability. She is now a sustainability analyst at, um, okay, I'm probably gonna say this wrong, but Servidine. And it's an engineering consulting firm where she provides lead and other sustainability consulting to clients in the existing commercial and also institutional building sector. Um, and in her, uh, in her work, she guides clients to improve their building performance in energy, water, waste, transportation, and um, generally the human experience in our buildings, which is something that I know we have some representatives across the state of Georgia that are working to incorporate um, in, a, in a government level in some of our buildings as well. Jaco, uh, in addition, hosts a podcast called Hopefully Sustainable. And she speaks with extraordinary people on a weekly basis that are making the world a more sustainable place. And you can find Hopefully Sustainable on iTunes as well as Spotify. And on that note, I would like to turn our program over to Jaco and I'm uh, and, and very, very pleased to have her um, over, oversee our program. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. First, feel free to turn your cameras on, but please remember to stay muted throughout the event so that we can hear all the amazing presentations. Throughout the evening, if you have any questions for the presenters, go ahead and put those in the chat. At the conclusion of the presentations, we will leave the last few minutes for a Q&A session. Now, as we get started, I first want to thank Kiwanis as well as Green Cell for having me be a part of this wonderful event. As Shelly mentioned, my name is Jago Selka and I am a sustainability analyst and the host of the podcast, Hopefully Sustainable. I became extremely passionate about sustainability during my time at the University of Georgia, and I've been so lucky to turn my passion into my career. Over the past five years, sustainability has become a popular buzzword that has entered many conversations. It has become a more prevalent topic and is becoming more of a focus as the reality of climate change sets in around the world. Often working in the sustainability field and being someone who is passionate about sustainability, it can become overwhelming at times to determine my role in the movement. 
I truly believe that we can all make a difference when it comes to the fight against climate change. It's easy to sit back and hope that someone else will make a change, but in the end, it comes down to each and every one of us joining this movement and coming together to make the world a better place for future generations. The sustainability movement requires everyone, whether you are in the highest level of government, all the way down to the individual. We need both global change and individual change because all together we can make an impact. My podcast is centered around hope and finding inspiration in everyday people who are working to make a difference. I can guarantee you that after tonight, you will leave feeling filled with hope for the future after hearing from all of these bright young minds who are going to speak about the ways that they are positively impacting their communities and the people around them. You are going to hear from Ollie Chapman, Kenny Kirby, Hanka Kirby, Mahitha Pothuri, and Lavanya Hariharan, five incredible students who are going to speak on various topics related to sustainability. For our first presentation of the evening, we are going to start out with a high level approach to fighting climate change. Inspired by Project Drawdown, Drawdown Georgia is building a movement to accelerate progress toward net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Ollie Chapman is currently a student at Georgia Tech studying public policy with an emphasis on energy and the environment. For the past year, he has been working with Dr. Marilyn Brown on Drawdown Georgia, developing ways to reduce Georgia's carbon footprint beneficially and equitably. During his time at Georgia Tech, he co-authored an article with Dr. Brown, Demand Response as a Carbon Reduction Policy, Evidence from the Southeastern U.S. State of Georgia, which is going to be published. Ali, we are looking forward to hearing about Drawdown Georgia and what everyone can do to get involved. Thank you for that more than generous introduction. So I'm going to hopefully share my screen. Oh dear. Okay. I have to. I fear I have to read. I have to rejoin the meeting to share my screen, unfortunately. So I will be back in 30 seconds. <laughs> We'll just give Ollie a few seconds to rejoin. What's an event during COVID online without a technology issue? So bear with us, please. You can never be too prepared for these kind of things. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. So hello, yes, my name is Oliver Chapman, or Ollie Chapman, and I'm currently a researcher um, at Drawdown Georgia. So Drawdown Georgia began a number of years ago when the Ray C. Anderson Foundation convened experts within the state of Georgia and asked the question, what can Georgia do? What can be the state's greatest contribution to reversing climate change? we realized that there was a real opportunity to lead on solutions. Inspired by the, inspired by the um, nonprofit project Drawdown, uh, which modeled and measured the planet's most substantive solutions to reverse some global warming and culminated in a best-selling book, Project Drawdown in 2017, uh, outlining the best climate solutions for the state. Um, I'm probably, I think this is the wrong presentation. I'm really sorry, guys. This is very embarrassing.
Okay. Okay. So product drawdown, it transformed the dialogue around climate change, focusing on specifically on solutions such as rooftop solar, utility scale solar, um, EVs, um, fusion power, wave technology, windmills. But it took a global aspect, um, a global approach to the problem of climate change. It didn't, it couldn't really tell us what solutions were best suited for Georgia. What works best here in Georgia is likely not what works best in, say, Alaska or Hawaii or Arizona. So every state around the world in any region, they're going to have a specific set of solutions that best suit them. And based on that, Jordan Georgia began researching, looking at what climate solutions have the greatest potential within the state of Georgia. But it didn't stop and stop with greenhouse emissions and complex carbon calculations. We realized that understanding the carbon was only the beginning. And what we really need to do was understand all of the ways that climate solutions matter to the people of Georgia. We wanted to know what would help equity, what would improve the enrich the economy, what would help clean our damaged environment, what would improve public health. And with this research backbone into the best climate solutions for the state of Georgia, we looked at how to build a movement, how to get as many people statewide involved uh, in encouraging and scaling up of these climate solutions. But we hope this goes beyond just Georgia. We hope that this can inspire other states and regions to develop their own climate plans, to link specifically on solutions that best suit that state or region. So you may be wondering, what exactly are the best solutions for Georgia? Well. Taking the 71 solutions available for use in the US, we applied a down select process answering the following questions. Is the technology market ready for Georgia? Is there sufficient local experience and available data for that solution? Can that solution reduce CO2 by one megaton annually by 2030? And is the solution cost competitive? This removed 51 solutions such as uh, tidal energy, which had no sufficient local experience, or fusion energy, which wasn't market ready. Uh, advanced concrete, which wouldn't reduce the carbon emissions by one megaton of CO2, or solar towers, which while a cool idea, aren't currently cost effective for the state of Georgia. So what exactly are the 20 solutions that best suit Georgia? Well, We've broken them down into five categories, electricity, transportation, food and agriculture, buildings and materials, and land sinks. And they are cogeneration, demand response, rooftop solar, large-scale solar, landfill methane, electric vehicles, energy-efficient cars, energy-efficient trucks, mass transit, alternative mobility, composting, conservation agriculture, plant-rich diet, reduced food waste, recycling, refrigeration management, retrofitting, afforestation and silver pasture, coastal wetlands, and temperate forest management. I've listed all these out for you because there may be some you might not have expected, such as maybe a plant-rich diet, you know, eating slightly less meat, or maybe you hadn't thought of alternative mobility. Instead of taking the car to the shop, maybe you invest in a bike or uh, you walk to the store, or simply demand response, which using forms of technology such as smart thermostats and smart dishwashers, we can alter the way we consume our electricity, pushing demand away from peak coal or peak natural gas and allowing the grid to become more dynamic in incorporating renewable energy. So what exactly does do these 20 solutions look like for Georgia? Well, beyond just creating jobs, helping address equity, um, and even empowering women, these solutions down to it can reduce our CO2 emissions. By how much? Well, under the current business as usual situation, Georgia's emissions are expected to stay at around 122 megatons of CO2. But by incorporating our 20 solutions, we could see Georgia's emissions fall by 2030 to 78 million metric tons. Metric tons. 
this is quite a significant number, particularly following President Biden's announcement that the US is going to aim to achieve a 50% reduction in its CO2 emissions by 2030 from a 2005 baseline. A 78, reducing Georgia's emissions to 78 million metric tons would lead to a 57% reduction from a 2005 baseline, meaning there's no real excuse for Georgia for not trying to achieve climate reduction and no real excuse for it to not be a leader, particularly in the Southeast. So I'm going to give you guys a brief kind of overview of what these kind of solutions might look like. So picking seven solutions, rooftop solar, utility scale solar, energy efficient trucks, electric vehicles, retrofitting buildings, reduced food waste, and afforestation and silver pasture. We're gonna use these seven solutions as part of um, Drawdown Georgia to examine how to best scale up and activate these solutions. So in the case of large scale solar, enacting an achievable potential for large scale solar could see a 12.2 megaton of CO2 reduction annually by 2030. Currently, there's only 1,570 megawatts of electricity generated by utility scale solar. Under no impetus, this is expected to grow to around 2.9 gigawatts of um, solar energy by 2030. However, by activating policies such as a 10% carbon tax, Georgia could more than double its um, utility scale solar generation capacity to 5.4 gigawatts by 2030. This would deliver the nearly 13 megatons of CO2 reduction by 2030 and allow utility scale solar to account for nearly 11% of Georgia's electricity generation. Additionally, rooftop solar, while a slightly harder area to address given um, cost concerns, still has a generated estimated capacity of 45 megawatts uh, in Georgia. This is due to Georgia's beneficial climate, um, ranking around the seventh highest um, solar potential in the state, in the country. However, we understand that meeting the exact generational capacity can be challenging given costs and various factors. So even limiting this to just a fraction of the generational capacity, around 10%, we would still see around a one megaton reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. For transportation, electric vehicles, and energy efficient trucks, by adding 3,100 EVs to Georgia's roads and imply ensuring that light vehicle duties, vehicles account for 50% of new um, EV sales, we could see a 1.8 million metric tons CO2 reduction by 2030. EVs coupled with Utility scale solar and rooftop solar are a really powerful combination as the more we reduce our reliance on coal and natural gas, the bigger impact electric vehicles can have on our state's climate impact. Building and materials. By requiring buildings or increasing the number of smart technology structures, smart thermostats, uh, LED lighting by only 2% in all buildings each year, we could see a carbon reduction of 2.8% by 2030. Food and agriculture. Georgia, Georgia and Georgia estimated that draw, um, Jordan's waste nearly 2 million tons of food each year. By reducing that by just 20%, we could see our CO2, our CO2 emissions fall by 20% by 2030 in line with the 1%, the one megaton reduction requirement for Drawdown Georgia. And finally, land sinks. Georgia's really fortunate with its natural environment. Nearly 60% of land in Georgia is current, covered by naturally recurring forests. And this acts as a carbon sink for much of the state. If we were to increase this by 10%, we would see a further 2.8% 2.8 megaton reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. And as we increase our forests, this increases, increases our ecosystem. This increases the opportunity for low cost recreation. This increases 
um, the cleanness of water, the cleanness of our ecosystem. All of these impacts have an impact beyond just the continued reduction in CO2 that I keep on talking about. It also has a big impact on our environment, our economy, our public health, our equity. Solar creates jobs and many concerns with people in reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, such as coal and natural gas, is it will kill jobs. But solar is there to pick up the pieces and to pick up the lost jobs. Currently, in many rural low income counties uh, in southern Georgia, utility scale solar is one of the largest providers for new jobs in the area. Um, expanding rooftop solar programs has the opportunity to also address equity concerns uh, with employment within the new energy sector by focusing on employment of um, African Americans, women who are generally underrepresented in these industries. There's also general massive benefits for public health. Reducing emissions by the level we've seen here can improve public health beyond just the reduced cases of hospital emissions for pneumonia. It can also improve the lives of our children. Studies have shown that reduced um, intake of harmful pollutants such as NOx and sulfur dioxide, sulfuric, can increase the IQ or stop the reduction in IQ points for new children born, can reduce the likelihood of um, prevalent children um, diseases such as asthma uh, and, and so on. So what are the next steps for Georgia and Georgia? Well, we want to know exactly what a reduction of CO2 emissions to 78 megatons will look like in the state of Georgia. So we're gonna be tracking the greenhouse gas footprint within the state. What does it mean for the sea levels in Savannah? What does it mean for the forest cover in Northern Georgia? What does it mean for uh, local communities in Atlanta, for congestion, for how long it takes to commute to work? These are all things we want to try and quantify and calculate. We also want to engage local businesses. This isn't just local politicians or state politicians um, role in reducing climate change. Local businesses can play a key role in getting on board with Drawdown Georgia to combat climate change. And finally, what I'm personally working on in planning and tracking solution activation. So what who currently has a rooftop solar panel? Who currently has a heat pump? Who currently drives an EV? Why are they? Why do they have that? Why does, say, um, a rural county up north not have these sort of things? Why does maybe a majority black county down south not have these, uh, not have EVs, not have um, heat pumps? We want to understand why that is so that when setting up and activating these solutions, we can make sure it's done in a balanced way so that doesn't just benefit Atlanta, it benefits your rural communities up north and it benefits uh, the Black Belt down south. We wanna make sure there's an equitable distribution of the benefits in reducing our CO2 emissions. So that's my presentation. I will put in the chat the opportunity to, the link to our website and a link to our group it where you can join local community members in commenting on local environmental projects and putting forward your own ideas. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Happy Earth Day, everyone. And I hope to see some of you checking out our Drawdown Drawdown website. Thank you. And apologies for all these technical issues. Thank you, Ollie. As many of us on the call are Georgia residents, it's encouraging to hear that our state can be a major player in the fight against climate change. Moving to the next presentation, a recent report from Carbon Majors, part of the Climate Accountability Institute, found that just 100 companies since 1988 were responsible for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. It is vital for corporations to be at the table when it comes to conversations around sustainability. As a current senior at Forsyth Central High School, Kenny Kirby is driven by climate action and corporate accountability in sustainable efforts. After recently completing a research internship with Brighter Investing, he became focused on educating his fellow peers 
on environmental demands. Upon finding the inroads simulator, Kenny is hoping to showcase the tool to increase awareness on our current issues, as well as bring about conversation over what we can do to preserve our future. He intends to learn more about sustainability at Georgia Tech in order to lead change in the corporate world and work on global security. Take it away, Kenny. Awesome, thank you so much, Jacko. All right, let me get my screen set up here. All right, I hope everyone can see all right over here. Okay, so as Jaco talked a little bit about, um, my name is Kenny Kirby, and uh, I just wanna thank everyone for being here, showing up today. Um, and I'll be talking about the En-ROAD simulator, which what I describe as is a path to widespread awareness. And, um, and basically it's this really great model that Dr. John Sturman from MIT, he's a professor at MIT, he ended up having to find a solution to a problem that he quotes here as, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. And I mean, I'm sure I've seen it before where, uh, where I'll be talking to someone and you'll see their eyes glaze over a little bit and they, they'll, uh, they'll lose focus a little bit. And basically he worked to solve that issue um, relating to climate change by creating an amazing model um, that's able to engage its audience and, uh, and help spread conversation over this issue that we're facing. Um, so I'm gonna start and talk a little bit about what En-ROADS is. As a system dynamics model, it is able, it is an interactive that's able to, um, to produce calculations and, and outcomes about what possible future situations might look like um, by taking in input about uh, by the user, you, um, to kind of that, that relates to solutions that we can work on right now in, in this day and age. Um, the En-ROADS acronym stands for Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Report, or um, sorry, Support. And basically it was this amazing, um, this amazing interactive built by Climate Interactives, MIT Sloan, Ventana Systems, and the Climate Change Initiative. Um, and its goal is to address complex questions with pretty simple but really relevant information. Um, it's able to, to put the user in power. It puts, uh, it puts you in power to kind of slide around solutions that we can work on right now. Um, and, and it's able to kind of educate the user and, and groups that focus on this in a, in a really amazing way. Um, so you might be asking, how is this possible? How does it help that much? Um, and I'd start off just by saying, First off, ground conversations are able to be fostered in events like workshops and simulation games that the Climate Interactives group comes up with um, focused on, and on the En-ROAD simulator and working with that tool. And this allows the teams to come up with really amazing statistics and messages that are able to help enroll others. You're able to, um, to kind of attract others using these really amazing, uh, using this really amazing tool. Next up, those are those who are focused in one area of the kind of socioeconomic system are able to see the bigger picture. It helps to it helps people see relevant and compelling information that relates to other areas outside of maybe their area of work or, or whatever their hobby is focused on, like um, like with plastic pollution. One might be really focused on reducing that as a whole, but when using the simulator, you can see the effect of plastic pollution along with many other solutions that are currently being um, currently being worked on and see what is the outcome of all of these efforts. As well as that, En-ROADS is able to focus attention on what really matters using high leverage sliders. Um, these sliders are certain solutions that are able to make big changes um, and that's especially important post COVID while we're kind of rebuilding our economy, we're working towards a better future. At this, at this time, we're able to really focus on what matters most and, and put, our, put our best foot forward. Now, getting to the chart itself, we have a little bit of a, a kind of the, 
the basic overview, the basic screen that you'll see when you get set up with the En-ROAD simulator. Um, as you can see, what stands out most right now are the, are the two charts that are in the beginning. The first one is labeled global sources of primary energy, and the second is labeled greenhouse gas net emissions. And while these two are both extremely important graphs that you'll be able to kind of tweak around and work with, you can also go into a menu once we get there. I'll, uh, I'll take us over there a little bit. You can also go into a menu and, and add in tons of different graphs. I'll show you some of the ones once we get over there. Um, next up, we have the temperature increase by 2100. It's this little number in the corner that says 3.6 degrees Celsius. And while that might seem like a small enough round number right now, that's actually a really important number that we need to decrease as much as possible uh, by the year 2100. Now, the goal of keeping this 3.6 um, under two degrees, which is what is preferred at the moment, um, is actually really necessary because of the irreversible impacts that may stand in our way. Um, including longer heat waves, more intense rainfall, higher, sorry, higher sea levels. And these are all really, really important issues that we need to focus on. Um, and, and this number right here is a really great, great way to see kind of our current effect on what, we're, on what we're working on. Now, here underneath, we're getting to the good part, are some of the sliders that you can manipulate. And while we see, while, while we can see uh, each of these, there's renewables under energy supply, you can subsidize or to end up taxing renewables. There's carbon price that you, can, that you can set up. There's different sliders like deforestation and even technological carbon removal. And all of these preset sliders, I could, you could call them, uh, use the best available climate science from the International Climate Agency, the Energy Information Administration, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which is compiling basically a, a big list of resources and, and current science information um, to make the most accurate prediction possible. And while this, these are really great preset sliders, as you can see, there's also little menus next to each of them, the three dots that you can click on. And you can jump in further to the advanced slider settings even um, and set specific alterations of your own within each group. You can view related charts and graphs and you can also gain a little bit of background knowledge. And I'll show you more of that once we get to the, once we get to the presentation itself. Now, finally, there's just a few things I want to keep, I want you guys to keep in mind while we're adjusting these sliders. Here are some topics and, and insights from the En-ROADS website that outlines a lot of some of the big ways that we can end up help um, and end up helping to reduce our, our temperature increase. Um, we see buildings and industry that can involve efficiency and electrification. We also see population growth patterns. There's energy supply. There's lots of different areas that we can really focus on. And I want you guys to pick one and think about which slider has the ability to kind of best represent your topic and then go on your own and experiment after this presentation. Um, so now finally, we are able to kind of jump over to the En-ROADS website itself. Um, here we have kind of a big layout. And, uh, and as I said before, I'll show you guys a little bit of these graphs right here. You can see there's quite a few graphs under the primary energy demand tolls group, but you can go even further. We can look at many, many other graphs <laughs> that you guys might be interested in. There's financial graphs, there's CO2 emissions by source. Um, and you can really experiment with those and see what you like to, to, uh, we like to look at best. Um, and sorry, as well as that, there are a few assumptions that are being made before I jump right into the sliders. Enros does a great job of compiling all the research from the sources that I mentioned earlier. But if you have an issue with any of these assumptions or would like to change things up a little bit, you can go right here into the settings and end up tweaking a little bit of things. There's afforestation growth time that might be currently that's set at 80 years based on recommendations but you might say that might be 70 years or so and um and now the the simulator will be able to take into account while you're adjusting the different sliders all of the assumptions that are being made so 
piggybacking a little bit off of what Ollie mentioned earlier with the Georgia Drawdown Project, I set up a few different uh, few different simulations that we can play around with uh, to see the effects on the graphs on the graphs themselves. First off, we have electricity. Now, this pertaining to Georgia, this might deal with implementing solar energies or renewables, which would be this slider right here. And we can go ahead and slide this a little bit up, see if we can subsidize this a little bit more. As you can see, we're making changes. This little green section right here definitely uh, grew a little bit. And the uh, the baseline scenario has, uh, has split apart from the current scenario. We've also gotten our temperature increase down by 0.1. And that's just by subsidizing the renewables kind of halfway. We can even go to fully subsidizing the tourism and gone down 0.2 degrees. Um, and experimenting a little bit further, we can click on the, uh, the expanded menu for the advanced settings. Here we have a little bit of an overview for the renewable section that you can read over if you need a little bit more information on the subject. And then we also have a lot of sliders here that are a bit more advanced if you wanna, if you wanna toy around with those. We have the renewables tax or sub subsidy start year. If you think that the subsidies might end up coming into effect later on, you can put that in there and, uh, and see the effect. Obviously the results are gonna end up becoming a little bit decreased as we expand that. Um, but along with that, we can view some related graphs. Here next to the, the sliders, we see renewables primary, primary energy demand. So that is the demand for the renewables currently. Um, along with that, we can see global sources of primary energy and low carbon final energy consumption. And this is all just for the renewable section. So there's actually graphs and related charts that we can view for every section. And if you need a little bit more information about the group that you're looking at, there's this helpful information button right here. And you can scroll through some examples. Um, there's key dynamics, potential co-benefits, which is one of my favorite uh, little areas that we can see, such as uh, for renewables, one of these states that renewables can help expand energy access during power outages. Um, which is a cool little fact that you might not have known before. As well as this, we can go down to the slider settings and we can view the specific settings that we are implementing when we are sliding the, the basic slider. And, um, and then also there's case studies, common FAQ, um, and just a little bit more information to you get for you to dig into while we're looking while you're looking at, uh, at it. Next up we have buildings and materials. Um, now, while, while this section here states that it states buildings and industry, there's two different sliders that we can work with this time. There's energy efficiency and electrification. And by, by changing these up, it actually has a, a, a pretty dramatic effect on our global sources of primary energy. We can see that dip. Um, it was a pretty big dip that we took when we increased our energy efficiency. As well as our electrification, we can end up kind of uh, expanding our renewables resource as well as taking down our temperature increase by 2100. Um, now getting to one of my favorite sections, I actually had to do a little bit of research looking into this one. We're coming up on food and agriculture. Now this includes plant-based diets and, uh, and improved crop systems, but I was thinking I want to talk a little bit about food and agriculture because I know it's really important, but there's no slider on the screen to help me do that. Um, so I did a little bit of research and I looked through and I found out that it is actually a combination of three different slides from three different categories. Um, and the first one would actually be under methane and other, which is actually under the detailed settings. Oh. All right, there we go. Looks like I left, lost my mouse for a bit, sorry. All right, the first one is under the detailed settings under methanes and gas. We'll have to switch that little slider on so we can unlock a few of these settings. Now there's agricultural and waste emissions. There's also energy and industry emissions and other greenhouse gases. Um, but for now, we're just taking a look at agricultural and waste emissions. Now, when we take this down, this means we'll be um, possibly using less cattle, using less livestock for, for um, consumption. We'll be able to um, make a big effect using that one. We can see we're taking down uh, resources quite a bit. 
uh, on our non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. But along with that, there's actually energy efficiency for transportation, which means we'll be using, we'll be using less transportation um, materials in order to transport around livestock or, um, or meat for consumption. We can increase this uh, by quite a bit. And finally, along with that, there is deforestation. Since we're using um, less land to raise our cattle and our livestock, and we're using more land to plant crops, we can increase that, which is gonna be a great way to actually uh, take carbon out of our atmospheres. So that was one of the cooler, uh, one of the cooler settings that I found within En-ROADS. If you're looking for a little bit more information on different examples for each of these settings, you can actually go up to the help and go to related examples. And up is gonna come a little, uh, a little pop up here that has a little bit of, um, a little bit of examples for each of the settings here. There's electric vehicles under electric, electrification for transport. And, um, and there's a lot of really great examples that you can look through. I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the insights that I saw after viewing this presentation, such as um, the difference between different, different sliders, I guess. There's high leverage sliders and there's low leverage sliders, as I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen by now. Um, resetting all these sliders now and going back to the kind of main screen, I'd like to show you guys a difference between new zero carbon energy source and a carbon price. Now, while a new zero carbon energy source is great, we'll, we'll make a breakthrough here, or even a huge breakthrough. We're gonna increase our new zero carbon energy while decreasing our other carbon sources, um, or sorry, our other energy sources. And we're gonna be able to, to take down temperature increase by about 0.2, but when we look at a carbon price instead, we can see that we're already uh, taking down our temperature increase by quite a bit, and we're increasing the amount of renewables that are thrown into the energy banks. And this is, as you can see, a very high leverage slider um, that, that, that is a key player within this. I'd like to show you guys, finally, um, my inroads, hold on one second, I'm so sorry about that. My own simulation that I created, this is just a little screenshot and I'll keep, I'll, I'll put some of these links into the, um, into the chat box for you guys to look at. But here I was able to get to 1.7 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, there's kind of a, um, instead of a silver bullet method, which some people might think is effective, you kind of have to use a silver buckshot, which requires a little bit of success in each of these categories. Um, so I'll leave you guys off there. Uh, I want to thank you guys for listening to my presentation, and I really encourage you guys to go out and test this simulation yourself and try and uh, try and invite someone to to talk to about it. It's a really great resource, and I uh, I hope you guys have an amazing Earth Day. Thank you. What an amazing tool, Kenny! It really helps to put a visual when it comes to the conversation around sustainable solutions. A passion for sustainability runs in the Kirby family as we now meet Honka Kirby. This past year, whether you live in Georgia or another state, we all experienced the importance of voting and participating in our elections. Honka Kirby is a public policy major at Georgia Tech with a passion for climate focused policy. She has been volunteering with Citizens Climate Lobby, a nonpartisan climate advocacy group for nearly five years, working to create political will for climate solutions at the federal level. She recently started a CCL chapter at Georgia Tech and is working to teach students about carbon pricing initiatives. While Citizens Climate Lobby is her main focus, she has worked with a variety of environmental groups and participated in fellowships with groups such as Our Climate, Climate Reality, and the UN Millennium Fellowship. Hanka hopes to one day work on furthering international climate policy initiatives and related negotiations. Now let's hear from Hanka. Thank you for that introduction, Jaco. I am going to start sharing my screen. Okay, can everyone see? Yes, we can see your screen, Honka. Perfect. All right. Um, so as Jacob mentioned, I have 
um, been involved with Citizens Climate Lobby for about five years now. Um, I love it. It is my passion. It is what uh, encouraged me to pursue public policy at Georgia Tech. Um, and I recently just started a chapter there as well. Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonpartisan grassroots advocacy group that um, is attempting to enact climate policy at the federal level, specifically a carbon price. And before I get into it, there's two types of um, carbon pricing mechanisms. One is a carbon tax and one is a cap and trade system. For the purpose of this presentation, we'll be focusing on a carbon tax. So our bill um, proposes a carbon tax that is revenue neutral. So what I mean by that is there is a tax or a fee placed on the source of fossil fuels. So well, mine, um, it in the bill is outlined to start at $15 per ton and increase annually by $10 a ton. All of that money is then collected at the federal level and distributed back to American households um, equally. So that incentivizes people to um, live more sustainable or less carbon intensive lives, um, switch to things like electric vehicles, but at the same time, they have an idea of what the increase in price will look like in things of gasoline, so they can see it coming and prepare for that. Additionally, it's expected that two thirds of American households will either come out ahead from the dividend or break even. Um, so this ensures that we protect our lowest income communities that are also gonna be most affected um, by climate change effects because we really care about the environmental justice aspect of it too. Additionally, there is a carbon border adjustment um, proposed in the bill. And what that means is when we're trading with other countries, if we are importing um, carbon intensive goods, then that country um, has a tariff levied on them so that they have to absorb the cost of that carbon intensive good if they don't have um, an internal policy such as this one that is scheduled to reduce emissions the same amount or more. So it encourages um, other countries to join us in, in bringing down global emissions. And this bill um, is great because <laughs> it is very effective. As Kenny showed us in En-ROADS, carbon pricing is the single most effective um, policy to bring down emissions quickly. It is not the only one that should be used, but it is one that um, gets us to, I think, um, well, here it says 40% reduction um, over the next and your faces are right in the way, but over the next 12 years. Um, so it is very effective very quickly. Additionally, it's great for families and people. Like I said, um, each family will be uh, making money back from the dividend. And depending on how you live your lifestyle, you're gonna get, that money is gonna be um, seen as preparing for the next sustainable transition, or if you're not making as much, it can encourage you to, um, to live more of a sustainable lifestyle. Um, so here it says an annual dividend for a family of four in the 10th year is over $4,000. So it's not a small amount. Additionally, it's great for health. Um, it will lead to a cleaner um, air quality. And not only does this save lots of lives, but it also uh, cuts down in healthcare costs, which is um, something that our representatives like to hear when we're pitching this to them. Um, and as it says here, uh, 295,000 lives will be saved by 2030. Um, and I can, can send the link to this study in the chat. Um, it's the REMI study. Um, that was done a few years ago. So, so it's good for families, good for people um, because it saves lives and it also creates jobs. 
So it's expected that 2.1 million jobs will be created in the next 10 years. Um, a lot of people, when we start talking about climate policy, get nervous because we would be transitioning from something like jobs in coal mining communities to new jobs. But um, it's expected that so many more jobs will be created that those people will have plenty of time to transition to, um, to other jobs. And CCL, this is our main bill that we propose, but we also are always looking out for ways to help uh, coal mining communities transition to a more sustainable um, job industry. So um, there is an act called the Reclaim Act that we lobby for in addition to this one um, that does exactly that and helps people get jobs in like um, natural resource restoration type communities. And uh, one of my favorite parts of the bill is that it is bipartisan. So uh, we really, really strive to gain bipartisan support for this bill because that ensures that the bill will be long lasting and it takes the political element um, out of it if we can all get together to take action on climate um, because it affects everyone. So um, I will talk a little bit more about that in some of the next slides, um, but we are trying really hard to uh, gain bipartisan support on the bill in this Congress. In previous ones, when the bill has been introduced, we have had bipartisan support and the bill was just reintroduced in the House. It's HR uh, 2307, if anyone is interested, and um, we are hoping to get bipartisan support on this one as well. So as I said, it is revenue neutral um, and two thirds of households will be expected to make more or make the same amount in the dividend than they would without it. So um, again, the size of the government will not grow. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how you might get involved with CCL and what you would expect from that um, in case you are interested. When I started, I was 16 and very, very shy. Um, and I never imagined that I would be speaking to my members of Congress on a, a topic like this or, or anything. Um, but CCL will train you in exactly what you need to know. Um, you go through practice rounds of talking about the bill and um, some of our group members will pretend to be representatives and they will be hard on you. They will be act very scary. Um, so you're well prepared by the time you get into a lobby meeting. Um, if I can do it, then anyone can. So uh, when you first join, like I said, they go through um, some some practice meetings like this. But if you're if you decide to stay in the group longer, you can also be exposed to things like. Uh, trainings on the economics of the bill in more depth than what I just covered, or understanding climate science, understanding more about how Congress works. That's another huge um, skill I gained from being part of this group. Um, and then communicating with progressives and conservatives, both, um, because you may be in both offices. And then we also spend a lot of time talking about some uh, some of the psychology behind climate science. Um, and that has been one of the biggest takeaways from this group because I, once you understand where other people are coming from that may not see eye to eye with you, it makes it a lot easier to have those conversations. So that is actually what I wanted to talk to you about next, um, because again, this was probably my favorite part of being with CCL. I feel like I could talk to literally anyone about this topic um, because I have respect for everyone's point of view. And that is something we try really hard to, um, to, to focus on in the group. Um, the, our first step every lobby meeting is thanking the member of Congress for something even if they see very differently than, um, than we do, and it can be hard to find. But that respect alone goes a long way in building the relationship um, and opens up the dialogue to be able to ask more um, 
just open questions. And so again, that has just been so beneficial to me, not only in lobbying, but just having conversations with neighbors and friends. Um, so every month we have monthly speakers that will come and talk to us about a variety of topics, uh, like I just mentioned. There was one a few months ago, uh, Jonathan Haidt, who developed something called the Moral Foundations Theory. And in this theory, he said that conservatives and liberals um, tend to have not necessarily different values, but rank some higher than others. And when I um, was first taught about this, it was kind of eye-opening for me because no value is right or wrong compared to another. Um, it's just that some people might value some more than others. So what I mean by that is um, he said that research shows liberals tend to be more concerned about harm versus care, which is things like um, taking care of the global poor or our homeless communities um, and also fairness. So that can be reflected in a lot of their legislation and, and political priorities, whereas conservatives um, are more concerned about these three um, latter values, which are in-group loyalty, um, meaning what are other people that I care about and consider to be credible sources also thinking about this issue, and then um, authority. So that could be things like, um, well, it, well, in this case, military is um, a very big factor in, in a lot of their uh, legislation. And then purity, sanctity. And what I mean by that, it could be um, like have a spiritual connotation or symbolic um, such as using the American flag um, in, in proper respectful ways. So Jonathan Haidt said, when you're having conversations about climate, if you appeal to some of these values, it might get you further. And if you understand them um, and remember when you're talking to not only representatives, but your neighbors, your family at Thanksgiving that might not um, see things the way that you do, if you can kind of understand the conservative uh, perspective then and respect that and show them that you respect that, then you can go a lot further in some of these conversations. So he said to appeal to in-group loyalty, um, you can use Republican figures that support similar policies before you use liberal ones. In the presentation, he had a picture of Al Gore, someone that um, I personally respect, I've had a training with, and and I see as a leader in climate, but many others may see as someone who is kind of on the extreme side um, pitching a policy like this. And then they also showed a picture of, um, of some prominent conservative figures also supporting policies. And that picture went a lot further in communicating these mes this message when talking to conservatives. Um, additionally, it can mean things like local versus far away climate impact and how um, how impactful that is when you're giving a presentation on on something like climate policies. If you're using um, far away impacts of climate devastation, um, then it's not going to mean much to someone who is just worried about their district. Um, so if you use examples like not in, instead of using how flooding is affecting um, islands across the globe, you can talk about islands, I mean, uh, how flooding is impacting Florida. Um, and then for authority and subversion, he suggested talking about how climate affects the military, um, rather than using example of like kids skipping school, uh, striking for climate that might hit harder with someone who is on the liberal side. And lastly, he suggested uh, to appeal to purity and sanctity. You can talk about like Christian environmental groups, 
Um, there's a uh, young evangelicals for climate action is a great one. And then just good stewardship of the earth. Um, and make sure when you're using symbols to be respectful in that message because we're trying to build a relationship um, rather than just talk about our policy and climate. And that I think is all I have for you today. Um, thank you again for listening and please let me know if you have any questions and happy Earth Day. What an amazing presentation, Honka, and a great reminder to stay connected to our local representatives. It's really exciting to see climate solutions in action. While it's important to see climate action from our government and corporations, schools are also the grounds for local change. Mahitka Kothuri is a senior at Alliance Academy for Innovation, completing the final year of the Energy Systems Career Pathway. She is an incoming freshman at Georgia Tech pursuing electrical engineering. She is the founder and president of her school's Eco Club and a recipient of the U.S. Green Building Council of Georgia's 2020 Chrysalis Award. Mahitha is passionate about renewable energy and her mission to protect the environment. Let's hear all about your work, Mahitha. Thank you so much, Jaco. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are having a great day. Happy Earth Day to everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about schools and their role in creating a sustainable future. All right, so since I am talking about school, let's all do some math real quick. Okay, so from kindergarten to 12th grade, kids spend a total of 13 years in school settings. The average school year is about 36 weeks and kids go to school for five days of the week and the average school day is seven hours. So when you multiply all of these numbers together, you get a grand total of 16,380 hours in a school setting. That is a lot of time. And when you spend 16,000 hours in a certain place, you learn a lot from them. Now that makes sense, I'm talking about school. Hopefully we all learn things from school. But right now I'm talking about things that are not the quadratic equation or the periodic table or you know verb tenses. What I'm trying to say is that the environment that a school setting creates plays a major part in shaping the, mora the morals and the the morals and the personality traits of the children. So that it makes sense then that sustainability should be something that is incorporated into, into school and curriculums, into school settings, so that from a young age, children are, are able to be taught the importance and are able to, exposed, be, to be more exposed to the concept. Now, having said that, I would like to talk a little bit about the school that has played a pivotal role in my passion for sustainability. My high school. As Jacob mentioned, I go to the Alliance Academy for Innovation. And Alliance Academy is an industry-based school that focuses on pathways and the development of professional skills and certifications. Uh, below is our campus, it's a beautiful place, and it is a school made for students of the future. And when I say that, what I mean is that every single class that we have is designed to make us as students leaders in the future, in the future job market, in the future economy, and most importantly, in the world that is being created. Each of our pathways are chosen because they each are a piece of the future. Each of these pathways represent a job market that is growing by at least 3% more than the average job market rate. So when our school puts so much focus on making sure that we are all future ready, it makes sense that sustainability is also a key value of our school. And one of the ways that it is, is through the energy systems career pathway. One of the career pathways at Alliance Academy is the energy systems career pathway 
uh, I am completing the final year of the pathway uh, this year. And in this pathway, we learn about uh, how renewable energy systems work, uh, how to maintain them, improve them, and most importantly, how to use them so that we can provide clean energy for our futures. So when we in this pathway, we learn a, a whole lot like a, a, from a wide range of sources. We do talk about our non-renewables, our traditional sources, and we talk about all sorts of cool things like nuclear and hydroelectric as well, getting down to the basic core principles, but also talking about how they're applied in our real world. And this real world application is by far the most important value of these pathways. For example, a couple of years ago, we visited the nuclear power plant and in Vogel that is, uh, that is by, uh, built by Georgia Power. And we learned a bunch of cool stuff like how these nuclear reactors actually work. The fact that apparently these towers are not where the reactions take place, but they're actually the cooling towers and the smoke that they produce is just water vapor. And also that there are numerous safety features built in to these power plants. We also learned how to communicate our results and our findings of, of research with others. But most importantly, we learned about how to, make, how to make our own aspects of renewable energy, whether that's designing our own wind turbine blades to figure out how to make them the most efficient uh, to, make the, to produce the most voltage. These are actually mine. I won that competition they had at school. Um, and also when we built we put solar panels on the roof of our building so that we can that our functioning can power our uh, our e-car batteries, our robotics uh, mechanisms. We can use them. We can plug. We can turn that, take that energy, put it into the wall, and plug uh, different outlets into it. And it, may, it helps us to learn the actual the actual concepts of how these systems work. You know how to what latitude or what is the impact of latitude on how you tilt your solar panel? Uh, what does the surface area of the blade have anything to do with how much energy it produces? Each of these fundamental concepts are turned into real world applications that make, that make these pathways so valuable in understanding how to be sustainable. Of course, schools are much more than classrooms. If, that were, if it were just classrooms, I think a lot of us would be very bored. But that's, we, there's all sorts of uh, before and after school activities that are great places for kids to discover their interests for different things. And because of that, student, whether they're student run or staff run, environmental clubs are great places to discover and develop your passion for the planet. Uh, as Jacob mentioned earlier, I founded my school's environmental club last year. And it's helped create a close, tight-knit community of people who are passionate for the same thing. And when you bring people together who are passionate about the same thing, it means that so much great stuff gets done. And it helps create a supportive community that allows us to take, the, take different projects that we want to do to make changes and to get, make sure that those changes go, are following through. And this support is more than just from students. S support from our staff, support from our administration can help create that feeling of empowerment, can help provide the courage needed for us to make changes. Because if we're given the freedom to make changes on our campuses, you know, safe places for us to express our opinions, then there is nothing that there, that confidence that is given to us means that there's nothing stopping us from making changes in the future. And when I talk about projects, I'd like to talk about a specific project that I, that me and my eco club did with our school cafeteria. So last year we switched our, so we, before what we used to have were these packaged utensils in wraps that you had, you know, like the fork, knife and spoon, and everything all in one wrap. They were nice and hygienic and everything, but they were also very wasteful and there are two reasons why. One is that if I just forgot my spoon at home, then I had to go grab the whole kit, use my spoon, and then throw the rest of it away without even using it. The second thing is that this nice little wrap, which keeps everything packaged, also is a bunch of plastic that has absolutely no reason to be there. So 
what we did as a group, we brainstormed a couple of ideas, did a lot of research, and in the end, we decided that our best, our best solution was to switch to the dispensers. Got rid of the plastic wrap, and if you only needed a spoon, you can get a spoon. You don't need to get the rest of it and throw it all away. And during our research, we found that it was also a lot more economically beneficial because it costs less per unit order. And after, initial, after a, somewhat, a somewhat larger initial cost, you ended up saving, we ended up saving the school year 15, at least $15 per order. So if you look on the right, you can see, of course, that there's, it does save a lot of money. It saved my school $15,000. And if it's implemented in the other high schools, it can save them almost $5,000 as well. But most importantly, this project allowed us to save 100 pounds of plastic from entering the landfill. 100 pounds is, it's a big number. And it might be a little bit hard to visualize, so I will now help you do that. I want everyone here to close their eyes and imagine a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot room. Go, go ahead. All right, so now you have this room and imagine that this entire room was filled with plastic trash. All right, the amount of plastic that it took to fill that room was the amount of plastic that we managed to save from entering our waterways from entering our landfills and breaking into microplastics, entering our food sources and all sorts of things that are help keeping our food sources and our water sources clean and also preventing this plastic from being, you know, you know, it sucks but it's in the environment and we just kept it from being there. So, and this project would not have been possible if it wasn't for the support that my school gave me and my eco club gave me. And I wanna encourage all of you whether you're still in school, whether you're out of school, to provide support for those who are trying to make differences because that support is essential when we're trying to get projects like these through. Because once we can make small changes, then the bigger changes become a lot easier. So that's all I had for you guys. Thank you for watching. Once again, happy Earth Day to everyone and let's march for a sustainable future together. Thank you so much, Mikita. I can't wait to see all that you accomplished. And I'm glad that there are students out there like you who are going to lead the way when it comes to the sustainability movement. Finally, you may be wondering, we've talked about everything from global solutions to local solutions, but how can we make differences as an individual? Lavinia is going to provide some great examples as well as inspiration for how to get involved in your own community. Lavinia is a senior at Lambert High School and will be pursuing environmental engineering at UGA. She believes in leading and also advocating for a sustainable lifestyle, like going vegan, for example. She is the founder and the president of her school's Eco Club. As a Green Cell Youth Board member, she is responsible for leading and working on various programs and campaigns. She has conducted, <clears throat> excuse me, two summer camps reaching over 100 elementary and middle school students to educate them all about climate change. She has also conducted various cleanup drives for Green Cell. With her internship with Keep Forsyth County Beautiful, she was able to shadow and help teach homeschooled students and local elementary and middle school students about a variety of environmental topics. Lavinia uses her position at Green Cell and her internship with Keep Forsyth County Beautiful to advocate for a greener world made possible by our youth. Take it away, Lavinia. Thank you so much, Jacob, for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I think it's still loading. All right, we'll just give it one second. Of course, COVID system, you know. <laughs> okay. So thank you again, Jacob, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Lavinia Hariharan, and I'll be representing Green Cell tonight. I hope you've all been enjoying the presentation so far. I know I've learned so much. So the organizations that we've seen so far are so powerful in the fight against climate change, with CCL advocating through the government, and Drawdown Georgia connecting the business, academia, and policy. 
But what I found though is many individual people see themselves as separate from these organizations and think that they're just one person and one person who's just switched to like reusable cloth bags couldn't, for groceries couldn't really compare to what these big scale environmentally focused organizations are doing. And trust me, I have also thought of myself as that person. I couldn't really see how one person can make such a big difference. But with Green Cell, as a grassroots level organization, we're able to bring all these individuals together and make our combined efforts profound. So today I'm gonna to start off with my story and how I got here. I'll talk about what Green Cell is, what we do, and how we connect to other organizations like Drawdown Georgia, who we saw today. I'll go over some of our accomplishments and then a little bit about why we're gathered here today. So I wanted to start off with my own story and how I was able to move on from that one person mindset. Ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be an astronaut or just study space, you know, your typical kid dreams. Um, I would always read all these like astrophysics books and be like, wow, these scientists are are finding all of these specific planets with these perfect conditions for people to move to and live in once this planet is gone because of climate change. And I went on with this mindset up until a few years ago when I realized, why am I only focusing on the planets we move to after this one is destroyed? Why can't we focus on this one first and do our best to fix it before it gets irreversibly damaged and we have to move like light years away to another planet that may just end up in the same condition as this one. And thus started my journey. I started an eco club in my school. Subsequently, I joined Green Cell and I also went vegan. This year I was able to intern at Keeper Scythe County Beautiful. And this August I'll be attending UGA as an environmental engineering major. So when I started um, an eco club in my school two years ago, I was able to bring all of my classmates who care about the environment together while also spreading the message of sustainability to others who may not be aware of the problems that we're facing. We've coordinated cleanup events at our local parks, hosted the Crayola Color Cycle, and we made YouTube videos spreading the word about recycling and not littering. With my internship at Kiefer Scythe County Beautiful, I was able to explore more of the environmental education sector with my mentor, Abram Willem. I just wanted to make a huge shout out to her for all that she does and what, um, and also a huge thank you for guiding me through this year and letting me experience the wide range of projects that we can do to help keep our community aware of what they can do to live sustainably. So Green Cell is a grassroots level organization and we raise awareness about human created environmental issues and we also promote conscious consumerism. We take the idea of multiple individuals doing their own part to combat climate change and bring them together to combine our efforts. Each person is at the center of their own little bubble where any changes that they make in their own lifestyle can influence their surroundings like their neighbors and friends and family. Green Cell is full of these individuals and we all take our part in combining our own little bubbles to create one big one where, whose impacts reach further and further outside the circle. At Green Cell, we believe that the change starts from you, the individual person, and from transforming yourself, you can transform your entire surroundings. We have level challenges that our members and others can take part in, from simple changes like switching to, re to a reusable bag to composting and buying locally grown food. The three facets of our operation that we focus on are awareness, action, and advocacy. And underneath each of these columns, I've listed the different ways that we spread awareness, the types of action projects that we have, and also how, how we do advocate. We conduct monthly webinars and have a growing social media outreach. We recently launched our Green Cell Calendar that provides sim simple ways people can engage in an eco activity or ecotivity for short for each day. We have a free steel utensil program, rental program that is very popular to avoid single use plastic usage for community gatherings. We also in initiate campaigns on waste reduction, material rescue, composting, cleanup drives, recycling, and smart consumption. We have also initiated food rescue drives and plan to row programs to help food pantries in underserved communities. And we promote sustainable solutions for everyday living. 
So the main thing I wanted to focus on today is that green cell bridges the gap between individual efforts and overarching sustainable goal, su sustainability goals set by the United Nations, individual cities, or nonprofits like Project Drawdown. We saw today with Drawdown Georgia that they have these excellent solutions to combat climate change. And with the UN Sustainab Sustainable Development Goals, these are international goals that need to be accomplished. And they show us where we need to be. But what's missing is how specifically individual people can do their part to make sure that these really big goals are being implemented and their targets are being reached. So at Green Cell, we make sure that all our education, awareness services, all our projects, all our campaigns, everything that we do connects directly to the statewide, national and international goals that you see here and that it's implemented in our community. Right now, we're hosting an art contest in which the prize is a, is a certificate for planting 20, 20 trees through Carbon Fund instead of a gift, something like a gift card. This lines up with the temper, temperate forest stewardship goal that you see at the bottom. The, the theme for the art contest is Every Day is Earth Day and is in partnership with Johns Creek Art Center, a local nonprofit that's celebrating its 25th year. And we are able to create awareness through the art that these kids are making. Lining up our projects with the large scale goals of the UN and sustainable development goals allows us to do our part in closing the loop. This helps us think globally with the state of our entire future in mind, but act locally and make sure we're doing what can be done from where we are. So with that in mind, we took a few Drawdown Georgia goals to show how a few of our projects connect with their ideals and how we're working alongside them to make sure that their goals are being implemented in our community. One of Drawdown's goals is to reduce energy consumption and decrease the demand for it. This project, this project that you see here is our energy consumption spreadsheet. We asked all 40 of our youth to document their energy usage over the entire 2020 year. This is an ongoing project, but what we hope to do is to first have our kids be aware of how much they consume and then consciously make efforts to reduce their consumption and therefore also reduce their carbon emissions. With all of this data gathered, we hope to offset all of our emissions created throughout 2020 through either planting trees or funding solar panels to be built and used by others. We'd also like to take this opportunity for our youth to map out how much it would cost to install rooftop solar in their homes too. Another project that we align with Drawdown Georgia is composting. Drawdown Georgia's goal is to compost 2 million tons worth of organic and food waste to reduce one megaton of CO2 in Georgia by 2030. Within Green Cell, we have 70 families that we know of composting an estimated five pounds per week. This is over nine tons of waste per year that isn't going to the landfill. 40 of these 70 families that we've listed here came from attending our series of composting webinars. These webinars have reached about a thousand people in just the last two years. So the actual amount of waste being composted is likely more than what's listed here since this only includes the number of families that we know of that are composting. Another project that we line up with is recycling. We've held multiple drives and campaigns for recycling, but four of our incredible families collect glass for their neighborhoods year round. In total, we've gathered over one and a half tons of glass in 2020 to recycle at local recycling centers. In simple terms, the effect of this recycling is equivalent to saving over 14,000 square feet of US forests for one year. This is Green Cell's scorecard over 2019 and 2020. You can see that 2019 was filled with event-based environmental conservation. Our impact that year was almost entirely based on decreasing single-use plastic items or single-use plastic usage or just completely avoiding it. In total, we avoided more than 131,000 single-use plastic items. We held various recycling drives, markers, and glass, and continue to spread awareness about living sustainable lifestyles and holding green parties. 
As COVID hit in 2020, we were actually able to diversify our efforts and held multiple campaigns and our youth created a summer camp, which I will go into more detail in the next slide. We started a series of webinars, which you can watch on YouTube, and also aided in food and medical rescues. Our partnership with MedShare saved 435 pounds of medical supplies from going to landfills last year. This is sent instead to countries that need medical supplies and we were able to save 360 patient lives. Through this year, we hope to create even more change through the combined efforts of all of our individuals. One of Green Cell's biggest accomplishments is our youth sector. We have about 40 middle and high school kids who actively participate in our weekly meetings and monthly events. Our weekly meetings give our youth an opportunity to practice in presentation and leadership skills as we have these kids take turns presenting a topic to the group. Each month, the presentations can cover a topic from a global to a local scale. Last year, we also introduced our first series of summer camps. The summer camps were entirely youth-led and youth-created from the presentations to the name and logo that you see over here. We chose five topics, one for each day of the camp, climate change, renewables, food waste, recycling, biodiversity, and everyday sustainability. And we presented those topics to elementary and middle school students to expose them to what they are and also what they can do about these problems as kids. Along with the presentations, we created hands-on activities, we call them ecotivities, to go along with each day's topic. We had over 100 kids join our summer camp last year over the two sessions that we held. Through the summer camp, we also advertised a few of our campaigns, like the three-minute shower pledge. We asked everyone to sign a pledge to take three-minute showers, and through that, we were able to save over 56,000 gallons of water. This year, we're coordinating a science fair to open an opportunity for kids to explore the STEM side of climate change and sustainability. Our youth go a step further and involve themselves in not only green cell activities, but also make sure their voices are heard in other organizations too. Kirtana, who helped make the flyer for this event, was involved with the Ocean Climate Action Plan this past week. We have other youth who are in the Student Advisory Council with Representative Carolyn Bordeaux and the Johns Creek Leadership Council. Change into a brighter future starts with our generation because it's us that are going to be living in and leading this planet next. The youth at Green Cell understand this and we all have that same core and drive to make sure our home is ready for us when we step up to fully live in it. So I'd like to close by sharing a video by Senator Gaylord Nelson, the creator of Earth Day in 1970. The creation of Earth Day sparked a worldwide movement that we are all currently a part of. It also led to the creation of the EPA and so many other government acts to protect our climate and environment. Okay, so the video is here. Our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty while forgetting about the worst environments in America. Our goal is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all human beings and all other living creatures. Our goal is a decent environment in its broadest and deepest sense, and it will require a long, sustained political moral, ethical, and financial commitment far beyond any commitment ever made by any society in the history of man. So today is the 51st Earth Day and the theme this year is restoring our planet. Restoring our planet is about building a new world together, breaking down our old habits. Our strength is in our numbers and our collective power is immeasurable. This, that video that we just watched was on the occasion of the first Earth Day, and we still do face the same challenges that they did today. And the fight is not over yet. So thank you everyone for being able to join us today and happy Earth Day. Back to you, Jaco.
Thank you so much, Lavinia. I truly believe that everyone can come together and make a huge difference, even if it's just on an individual level. And I want to thank everyone for all of these wonderful presentations that we have seen tonight. We are going to transition into a question and answer session for the remainder of the night. So if you have any questions for the presenters or that you want to ask each of them, please go ahead and put those in the chat and we will get to each of them as we go through the next few minutes of the event. And I know that we've gotten a few questions so far, so we'll just start with those and keep sending them in the chat as more come up. The first question that we have is for Ollie. And Terry wants to know, how would you see the 10% carbon tax implemented in Georgia? Okay, uh, hello. So for the case of um, Georgia and Georgia, we first used the tax as a way of modeling how that would impact our solar production. As we move into phase two, we want to understand how, what that might look like for the state of Georgia. Um, I think as addressed by um, the Kirby's, um, being able to collect this tax and then pay it back to the residents of Georgia in, term, in the form of a dividend would definitely be what I would see as the most beneficial way, especially considering, at least in the short term, transitioning to solar does tend to lead to an increase in electricity prices. So by collecting the revenue from this tax and redistributing it to the residents of Georgia, we would be able to offset um, sort of increase the potential increases in prices for residents of Georgia. We think that's very important because as we all know, um, the lower your income, the higher the percentage of your income will go towards energy costs. So it's very important that when we carry out these kinds of policies, we're not placing a larger burden on our most vulnerable. And then we actually had one more question for you, Ollie. Linda wants to know, do other states have similar programs to draw down Georgia or are there ways for people who are tuning in tonight from other states to get involved? So in terms of draw down Georgia, it's unique to, to us as a, an academic research led um, project that's emphasis has the emphasis on solutions specific to that state. Other states have pushed forward with their own climate plans. Um, Georgia is not yet. We hope that will change soon, and we hope our work has can help influence and inform policymakers in the state to adopt a climate plan in line with the Paris Accord or President Biden's um, new fifty percent reduction. Um, but states that have already enacted their climate plans, we hope something like Drawdown Georgia can help inform them in their, the policies they make going forward. Because, I mean, like, obviously, when you think about solutions, you're not going to be building solar panels in Alaska uh, and you're not going to be building windmills where the wind doesn't blow. But other solutions like, you know, is composting best for for your state is um, demand response, does that work? Does EVs work for your state? You know, some states' grids aren't clean enough for EVs, so actually scaling up EV use would be more harmful. It would just move emissions away from cars and towards coal and gas plants. So while for some solutions it may be obvious whether they work in the state or not, others maybe not so. And we think it is beneficial to not just put forward policies for the sake of um looking like you're doing something it's it's been you know we have a limited scale of time to do this so we want to make sure the policies you put forward are the right policies for each state and in a country like the us i think that's very important thank you ollie next we have a question for kenny for people who want to share different scenarios that they create in inroads, can you save different scenarios or what is the best way to share your findings with friends and family or anyone you want to share those with? Of course. So I actually ended up sending a link earlier in the chat towards a scenario that I created that I showed you guys for a brief amount of time. Um, that you can click on that'll show my own scenario and the specific edits that I made to that. 
Um, in order to do that, I believe there is a share button in the upper right corner of the screen. There's a little button that says share and you can copy your link. Um, and then you can send it to your friends, your family, and, uh, and just show them a little bit about the solutions that you ended up finding out a little bit more about. Um, but yes, definitely. I, I, sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. <laughs> No, that's great. I think a lot of people will be using the tool and finding it really beneficial afterwards. So that's great to hear. The next question we have is for Hanka. I know that I found learning all about lobbying from you to be really interesting. Can you describe what happens when you are lobbying the members of Congress? Sure. So we usually um, have a plan and only half stick to the plan every time because you never know where the conversation is gonna go. So um, CCL National will divide out um, lobby groups based on your district and your chapter. And um, there's a liaison in CCL um, for every district. So once we're connected, um, we try to do a little bit of research on the members background um, and then we usually have our primary ask, our secondary ask, such as the Reclaim Act, if they're in a community that has a lot of coal miners. Um, and, and so we do introductions, we thank them for something, and that is most of our plan. Um, we never know where it's going to go. Uh, they could have tons of questions. They could speak the whole time. Um, which is actually what we want. We want to get a better feel for um, how our members view this. Um, a lot of times they tend to ask a lot of questions. So the meeting usually consists of us just trying to answer their questions as best as we can. Um, and then we end with what follow-up materials they're interested in. Um, and, and that's it. Thank you. I'm sure it's a really amusing experience to be able to speak directly to our representatives. The next question is for Mahitha. I know a lot of people were very inspired by your project on reducing plastic usage at your school. Do you know if any other schools heard about your project or have implemented anything similar? So we did actually speak to the Forsyth County Nutrition Director, Ms. Bowers. And when we presented to her, she test, she wanted to put Alliance Academy as like a pilot, like a sort of like a testing one. And the plan was uh, for either later that school year or for this current school year to roll out the dispensers to other high schools to start seeing the benefits there as well. But what ended up happening, uh, you know, COVID came and took over the world and uh, they wanted to limit those high contact surfaces. And unfortunately, dispensers did fall under that category. So right now we are kind of working to try to find other solutions that might be able to give some of these same benefits. But we're hoping that if like once this COVID pandemic kind of dies down, we can go and push that project forward again. Yeah, that would be really great. I think it would have a huge impact in Forsyth County. And we actually have another question for you. I'm sure you have gotten to take some really interesting classes during your time at Alliance Academy. And Ken wants to know, can you talk about your favorite class that you have gotten to take so far? Yeah, if you so, can pick one. <laughs> right. Um, I, I love my pathway class. It is so much fun. It's so much, it's so much in light. Like it's, we learn so much from it. I think maybe one of the biggest things is that maybe is a little bit missing from our education system is the ability to say why we're learning something. Like, I don't know how many times I've had this question if I'm learning something in math or English of when am I ever going to use this? And when I'm in the, when in our energy pathway class, when we're actually, you know, installing solar panels on a roof or when we're, you know, we're using 3D printing machines to build wind turbine blades or, you know, we're actually in front of a nuclear power plant. It's easy to see what, how what we're learning in that class is, um, is being used in the real world. We can see, you know, how our chemical reactions are turning into energy sources. And that's, I think, by far the coolest thing that I've done in the energy pathway. 
Thank you, Mahita. We have a few questions for Lavinia now on your presentation. The first question is, does Green Cell have a list of products that they recommend? For example, if someone wanted to get trash bags that are not made out of plastic, where can they maybe find more information about those types of resources? So we actually don't have an entire compiled list, but we can definitely take that and make one. Um, but we do have a Facebook page where we'll definitely take your questions and our team at Green Cell can definitely get back to you about any questions that you have. And our Facebook page also does have lots of tips and ways to lead a sustainable lifestyle. So if you have any questions, I'm sure loads of our posts on our Facebook page can definitely answer that. And then we have another question about Green Cell. Are you aware of if Green Cell plans on expanding to maybe any other counties in Georgia or even to any other states across the US? So I'd say we'd definitely be open to it. Like that would be such an amazing project for us. Um, the main thing that we'd want to focus on if we do spread around, we wanna make sure that it's like we stay local in the sense where it's the people changing their lifestyle and making sure that they're going green and all of these ideolog ideologies are staying the same across the board. But yeah, we I think it might be going in the talks right now if we are um, spreading out, um, but I'm sure we'd be very excited for it to happen. Great. Well, if we have anyone tuning in tonight from other states, they can maybe reach out to any of the contacts at Green Cell and we can get that expanding into other counties and across the US. And as we near the end of the program tonight, I have one question for all the panelists tonight. On my podcast, I end every episode by asking the guests what they are hopeful about. So I know that today is the 51st Earth Day and climate change a lot of times can be a dark subject, but in the end, I think we all have to have hope to keep us moving forward in this movement. So I would love to hear what each of you are hopeful about. I'll go first, I guess we'll go in order of presentation. Um, in terms of climate change and attacking that, I'm hopeful that the US, um, Georgia and the US as a whole can regain its position as sort of the leaders of pushing this forward. You know, if two countries can really alter the direction of the world, it's the US and China. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm here, you know, I, I don't speak Mandarin, so I chose to come to the US to try and do what I can to push the narrative that this needs drastic action needs to happen now. And I'm, I'm, I was very pleased and I'm more hopeful now, especially after President Biden announced the 2030 goal. I think a mid, a mid goal from 2050 of 2030, reducing emissions by 50% has really put us on a, on a good track to try and to address this very serious problem. So I grow more hopeful every day. All right, I, uh, I guess I'm up next. I, uh, I'm honestly pretty hopeful for a, a reduction in our temperature rise. I know that's, that's the big issue for us right now. Um, we're facing sea level rise, as I mentioned earlier, we're facing kind of destruction in our environments. Um, and I think, I think as we move along, as, as time goes on, we're gathering more and more people to, to do the right thing. So I'm hoping that we can all kind of band together on this issue and work towards lower temperature changes. Yeah, along the lines of what Ali said, I am hopeful for climate action on Capitol Hill, um, especially after the climate summit. So I'm hopeful when I'm sitting in front of this computer right now and seeing a, a Zoom call full of that had almost 55 people in it. And all 55 of these people are so interested in what we have to say. And they're giving us the support to do, you know, talk about our story, talk about our stories, 
maybe giving us the confidence to do even greater projects. That makes me hopeful because that number is 55 today. And it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger when we talk more and when we connect with more people and make this an everybody's issue and make the solution everybody's solution. And I'm definitely so hopeful for the hands of our future and the hands of our future generation. And the amount of time I spend working with kids and other, um, like my classmates and other people my age, I just see just how powerful we can be as an entire generation when we come together and how far we can go with the amount of um, youth that we have um, in this time period who are so aware of the problems that we're facing. Um, we're gonna have a very powerful next generation. <laughs> so that's definitely what I'm hopeful for. Thank you to everyone for sharing. I know that you all are giving me so much hope. So I'm very excited for the future. And I'm just going to share a few slides as we come to the end here. We wanted to leave everyone with some tangible action items. Let's see. Okay, so you may be wondering after today's event, how you can take action. So the first way you can contribute to the fight against climate change is by volunteering in your local community. If you are in Georgia, Kiwanis, Green Cell, and Drawdown Georgia are always looking for community support. If you are calling in from a different state, there are similar organizations or chapters of these groups across the US. The second way to make an impact if you are in a financial position to do so is to be attentive to where you spend your money. Consider an investment's financial returns and its overall impact. Donate to nonprofits who are investing in the sustainability movement. You can also support your local businesses and farmers. If we demand sustainable products, companies are going to see that and be forced to shift their business models to become a force for good. Finally, the third way is to speak up about issues you are passionate about. You can join a CCL chapter and lobby your local representatives as Honka talked about or you can join a student advocacy group like both Lavinia and Mahitha have founded at their schools. Or you can also just talk about sustainability with your family and friends and neighbors and everyone around you. I wanted to put this up here as some contact information for the groups that are sponsoring the event tonight. You can find more information about Kiwanis, Green Cell, and CCL online. You can also listen to my podcast, Hopefully Sustainable. I've actually interviewed a lot of the people here tonight. So if you're interested in learning more about the work they can do or the work they're doing, you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or more. And now I am going to hand it over to Shelly to finish out the event, but before I let everyone go, I just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to be here tonight on this Earth Day. Remember that it's all about progress, not perfection. And now I will hand it back over to Shelly. Um, first of all, I want to thank Jaco again. You just did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to host this. Um, we, Terry and I had an opportunity to listen to your podcast a few weeks ago, and it was very inspiring. Uh, it's amazing what young people can do. I also want to give a shout out to a young person who's on this call, but was not part of the panel. Her name's Kirthana and she's with CCL and she did the graphics for our flyer for uh, this event. And we are very appreciative of her hard work as well. And I would be remiss not to mention that Terry Welsher is on, a, on this call with us this evening from CCL. And like Jaco mentioned, we have so many organizations for people to, um, to get in touch with. One of the things that I want to close on is, you know, personally, uh, getting in touch with different people um, in, in our community is inspired us as a family. So we are composting now and and my husband got a chicken coop for his birthday. So, so when he's looking into horticulture, so it's, it's exciting when you can, like, um, like, these young people have shared, pick the thing you want to work on, you know, focus on something you can do. But the other thing that I really want to share as we close is, 
you know, you, you feel like when you're putting on an event like this, well, what if we're just preaching to the choir? You know, we're just bringing people together. They're like-minded. And is that going to make a difference? It really does. Because what I'm seeing just in having all of you be on this call is that we have a multiple uh, level of organizations and efforts um, within our school systems, you know, within our government representations and, and on a local level. And all of that together is what um, is what is going to really make a difference. And, and like so many other people already shared, the young people on tonight's panel, they give me hope. <laughs> They're my hope. So happy Earth Day, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, guys. It was great. Thank you, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy Thank Earth you. Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Happy, Happy Earth Day, Day guys. Fantastic. Honest. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Great. Great, great job. Show. Thank Impressive. You. Mm -hmm.